Hey folks, welcome to our final module for 5253. Um, in this one, we're talking about the application of learning theories specifically to instructional design slash planning for teaching and to our learning environments. And I have a confession to make. This is the second time I have recorded this. Um, I recorded three videos back to back only to discover that my audio wasn't recording the entire time. So second time's the charm, I guess. And so this final module is really meant to be a couple of weeks where you can review some of the learning theories we've discussed this semester and connect the dots with regards to planning your teaching and setting up your classroom space. And as I was planning this course, I was really torn between whether I wanted to do this module up at the beginning um, or if we should do it at the end. And I ultimately decided to leave it to the end because at this point we have talked more about um, different learning theories and we have a bit of that context that we can apply to this sort of discussion. So I think it's a nice way to wrap up our course. And in this video, rather than providing a comprehensive overview on the ideas presenting in the readings, I'm going to just talk about some of the different concepts and bring in some of my own experiences as an educator, educational researcher, learner myself. Um, for example, I'm talking a bit about how I apply learning theories to my course design and setting up my learning environments. And for the latter, I'm going to do a second video talking more so about how I do this in a face-to-face -face class. So let's start off with planning and designing our classes using learning theories. So for this module, one of our first readings was an article on instructional design and learning theories. And this article is very much written with cognitivism in mind, but it also does talk about behaviorism and constructivism. And it nicely complements our um, Ertmer and Newby 2013 article that we read um, up at the beginning of the semester that talks about behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism from an instructional design perspective. And the reading describes these as being the three big learning theories. Um, and I would say it's also pretty consistent with the ones that are most popular in our class. Um, most of you have talked about these three in your final projects, proposals. Um, your, the philosophy of, of um, teaching and learning I've graded so far, some of your portfolios. Um, although some other ones did come up in our course, um, such as humanism, actor network theory, communities of practice, just to name a few. And our reading also talks about andragogy or adult learning theory or adult learning principles, um, which quite a few of you are also quite influenced by in your teaching practice. And I do really like this article because it's quite explicit about how learning theories are linked to instructional design, of course, through more of a cognitivism lens. So if this doesn't totally resonate with you, um, that's okay. It just could be you have a different philosophy of teaching and learning. Um, for example, this semester we have also talked about theories that are more influenced by sociology and anthropology, which resonated more with some of you. This is just a really good example of behaviorism and cognitivism, particularly Bloom's taxonomy, as applied to instructional design. So if we turn to the article and take a look at figure four, it depicts the utilization of Bloom's taxonomy when writing your learning objectives and how these objectives are related to the selection of appropriate teaching methods and assessment methods. And we did talk about Bloom's taxonomy earlier in the semester when we were discussing individual learning. I also talk about it in one of my videos from EDU 5202 I'm planning to teach, and I'll link um, both down below if anyone's interested in a little refresher on Bloom's taxonomy. Now this model that they share here is something that I do personally consider when planning my courses and my activities. Um, I do use Bloom's taxonomy when writing my learning objectives. And I consider what each um, objective will mean for the teaching strategies and the assessment strategies that I'm selecting. And for me, a really key element here is having consistency between that learning objective, the teaching method I use, and the assessment method I use. And all of this is grounded in theory. And the kind of twist that I put on this model is when I'm considering this, I look at it more from a complexity science lens, particularly thinking about um, nested systems and how um, all these different levels of learning are ecologically nested within one another. So when writing my learning objectives and doing my planning, I do consider which learning system, so to speak, that I'm targeting and considering how this um, system is ecologically nested within other systems. And I use this to help me write my objectives and select appropriate teaching strategies and think about how I'm going to assess the learning outcomes for that um, learning objective. So for example, for our course this semester, our fourth objective for our course is uh, for learners to be able to clearly articulate your current philosophy of teaching and learning including reflection on your teaching practice um, and your values grounded in theoretical perspectives and scholarly slash professional literature on teaching and learning. So, so this particular um, course objective is very much looking at you as an individual. So looking at the individual level on the nested systems diagram and considering your past experiences. 
So here, constructivism to me makes a lot of sense to bring in. So here, reflection is a very appropriate strategy, um, such as through your first paper you did for this course, um, giving you space to reflect on how your philosophy of teaching and learning is developing through your MLC portfolios before ultimately writing your philosophy of teaching and learning. And all of this is consistent with constructivism. And I do use rubrics here though, which are arguably more aligned with behaviorism. I just really love rubrics because of their clarity. Um, but I do tend to differentiate here a bit between the assessment method I'm selecting, like my, like say a portfolio, um, a paper or a presentation and the actual assessment tool I use for it. I also use rubrics to support um, the concept of enabling constraints because there do need to be some constraints on an assignment or activities um, to support innovation and creativity, but with also while providing some structure so um, learners aren't overwhelmed. The second piece I want to touch on here is learning environments and how we can use learning theories to inform our teaching um, and learning environments. And this is an area I'm really interested in, and I have done some work on it before. Um, the first article I actually ever published was on space and place in interprofessional education. Um, and I kid you not, when it first came out, I actually framed it and put it in my hallway because I was so excited that I was a published author. And we're going to start off here by talking a bit about what space and place is, and then we're going to talk about it in terms of learning environments and learning theories. So here we're talking about where teaching and learning actually take place. And so before we get into this, just take a moment to reflect. Where does teaching and learning occur in your educational or professional context? Often this is more um, traditional formal places we think of with learning, like such as the classroom. But as we've talked a little bit about before, particularly when we talked about critical pedagogy, it can also happen in other places like staff rooms and hallways, things like that. And our physical environment can really drive our teaching and learning and how we put our philosophy of teaching and learning into place. So for example, I've had to teach in lecture halls where the chairs are actually attached to the tables and the tables are bolted down to the ground. Um, so it makes it very challenging to use teaching strategies that are more informed by social theories of learning for in-class work at least. Um, so for example, doing case studies and problem-based learning in class is possible, but it is far more challenging in a space like that. And so this brings us to the whole concept of space. And space is defined by geographical location and material form. And this can be analyzed in terms of quantifiable attributes and patterns. And space is really seen more so as just being the container where learning is occurring. So the actual physical architecture and things like chairs and desks being bolted to the ground would fall under space. However, it is also important to acknowledge that spaces and buildings aren't just neutral backdrops to learning. They are filled with people acting out their lives. So spaces and buildings can have an impact on the behaviors and learning that is occurring within them. So for example, um, experiential learning is huge in health professions education. And how a hospital unit is laid out will impact the learning that occurs in practicum placements. For example, is there enough room for teaching in the hallways? Is there a conference room? Is there a lounge where um, trainees can interact with those that are more centrally located within the local community of practice? And is it an interdisciplinary or interprofessional lounge, or is it, say, just for um, one profession? Like, is it a nursing lounge? Is it like the doctor's lounge? Things like that. So are we allowing for that sort of collaboration and interprofessional education that can occur in a workplace? And of course, we can consider this far more broadly in other workplaces in general, as well as places like schools. And so the concept of place, as we're discussing it here, is far more aligned with social constructivism. And in fact, this whole discussion of space and place and learning would fall more so under the domain of sociocultural theories. So things like social constructivism and communities of practice, um, because these theories consider how social processes and structures shape meaning, behaviors, and interactions. So place does consider geographic and material form like space does, um, but it also considers the meaning and the value that is associated with the physical space. So it's very social and relationships are very important here. And the supplementary reading I shared this week on space and place for this module states that place can be seen as a negotiated reality that is created and maintained, and on occasion, contested through human interaction with each other and their environment. So it is very much aligned with coherence theories of learning, especially sociocultural ones. So when we're looking at where learning is occurring, there is location and material form to consider, as well as the values that are attached to the place. 
And before we move more into learning environments, I have a few questions for you to reflect on. So what are some factors pertaining to space that can impact teaching and learning? How about place? How can space and place impact how and what we teach more broadly? And how can we use learning theories in relation to space and place to inform our teaching practice? And now with that, let's delve into our reading on learning environments. I think this is a really neat article that complements our other reading um, because in the first reading we discussed on instructional design, they talk about using learning theories to design lessons and courses. And this article also gives us some ideas of how these learning theories translate into the actual physical environment that we teach in. Um, so our first instructional design reading does touch on this a bit. Um, for example, in their checklist for a flipped classroom model, they prompt us to consider the instructional setting and whether it is conducive to learning, specifically um, a flipped classroom model in that case. But we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it actually mean for an instructional setting to be conducive to learning? And like many things we've discussed this semester, I think this is going to be highly dependent on your own philosophy of teaching and learning, how you as an educator define learning, and then thus which learning theories you are bringing into your practice. So we're going to talk about a couple of examples here from this article, and then in the next video I'm going to share my own complexity science inspired example. So let's start off with behaviorism. So if you go to a search engine like Google or an image sharing website like Pixabay, and you type in the word classroom, you're going to see a lot of images like this. And this is certainly what most of my classrooms looked like as a learner before I did my PhD. Um, and these are all examples of behaviorism applied to a classroom setting. And if we think back to module two, behaviorism is concerning learning to be all about change in the performance of a behavior. And our reading shares some schematics of what this would look like at um, a school level and at a classroom level. So they describe schools heavily influenced by behaviorism as being often um, single buildings with several stories. So often new learners are at one end of the building and as they progress through the grades, they move over to the other side of the building. Uh, for example, my own elementary school had separate wings for different, I guess, divisions really. So we had one wing that was more like kindergarten to grade two-ish. Um, around grade threes and grade fours were often another wing. And then upstairs was roughly grades five, six, and seven. And so we moved through the building in this way as we progressed through the grades. And within behaviorism, um, hallways are seen more so as just being a method of movement from place to place, rather than being places where learning is also occurring. Um, so here you'll often see them, the typical long corridors or hallways with classrooms on either side of the hall. And in classrooms, a behaviors classroom often has rows and columns for desks. And the teacher's desk is usually up at the front and it's the main um, point of focus and control in the classroom. Another example shared in our reading is constructivism. And here they show a potential layout of a Montessori classroom as an example, and whether Montessori um, is a learning theory into itself or a type of constructivism or even complexity science. Um, I think really is dependent on your personal and professional beliefs about what learning is. Just a little aside there. Um, so constructivism, if we think back, looks at how individuals construe meaning and knowing rather than it being something that's acquired. Um, so Piaget's constructivism being more concerned with personal sense making and connecting new knowledge to pre-existing knowledge and Vygotsky arguing that individual knowing originates in social interactions before it is later internalized as individual knowing. And our reading for this week describes a constructivist school as having hallways that also function as learning spaces and being places of social interaction. And as you can see from the schematics they've shared here, um, the actual classroom environment looks quite different. So here they've designed for spaces that allow for some individual study as well as group work. And in my next video, I am going to show you my own example of a, um, a more complexity science uh, um, inspired approach may look like in a classroom. Uh, I'm recording these back to back. So when you see this, it is already up and done. So I will link it up in the cards for you. And I'm going, other than that, I'm going to leave this one here for now. So um, please do let me know if you have any questions. And as always, I will see you all online. Bye.